Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the University of Waterloo, whether you are here in person or you are joining us virtually. Before we begin tonight, I would like to give a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional territory of the Attawandaran, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promise to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. I encourage all of you to take a look at whose land. You can Google whose land or you can follow the link that I have up here or the link that's gonna be dropped into the chat. And I encourage you to take a look at the territory that you are living and working on that is home to indigenous peoples in your area. So welcome everyone. I just have a couple little housekeeping things for those of you that are here in the room and those of you that are online. Um, for those of you that are present here in the room, the washrooms are all the way down at the end of the foyer. There's wet paint signs on the doors. Um, they're on the left side at the end of the hallway. For our virtual guests, we will be recording this presentation, but you don't need to worry about photobombing or having your voice recorded because that is all switched off for you. I would recommend that you keep the view of your screen, which up in the top right corner, you can click the view to side by side gallery, and that will enable you to see uh, Dr. McGuire as he speaks today. So I'll encourage you to leave messages in the chat. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves, share where you're uh, joining us from virtually. And um, when it comes to asking questions for Liam, feel free to do so during the entire talk. And you can leave those questions in the Q&A feature that's at the bottom of the screen. And Liam will answer those at the end of the presentation. And I think I forgot to introduce myself right at the beginning. So I'll introduce myself now. I am Kirsten Mueller and I'm the chair of the biology department. And it is my absolute privilege to be here tonight to introduce you all to Dr. Liam McGuire, who is a fairly new faculty member in the department of biology. He's been with us for almost three years. Liam carried out his PhD on the physiological ecology of bat migration at the University of Western Ontario, and then carried out a postdoctoral position at the University of Winnipeg before taking on an assistant professorship at Texas Tech University. And then we got really lucky and Liam joined us as an associate professor in the early part of 2020. He has published over 70 papers that encompass numerous bat species and on topics including migration, white nose syndrome, hibernation physiology and behavior. And I hope that you will join me in welcoming Liam today to speak to us about his research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsten, that's, that's great. Um, so this was this was an easy ask when, when I was asked to give this talk tonight is the, the, the mandate was can you come just talk cool stories about bats like I could, I could do that all night so uh, I sat down I started working on this and I prepared a beautiful four hour lecture right so we're gonna hear all kinds of great stories, and then I was told I don't have four hours so I've cut it down to something a little more manageable but uh, there's lots of fun things in here. First thing I have to do before I really get into this is is come clean. Um, I give a title of the science and mystery of bats which I blatantly ripped off of a book that was recently published by my PhD advisor, Brock Fenton and Nancy Simmons, who's the curator of mammals at the American Museum of Natural History, uh, The World of Science and Mystery. And I, I, it just encompasses perfectly the way I like to think about bats. There's, there's lots of really neat science. I'm gonna tell you some of those stories tonight, but there's also all kinds of just, just fantastic mystery. And the more we get into it, the more curious things we find. And, and this really sort of encapsulates all that. So if the stories I tell you tonight are exciting and interesting to you, Go and find the book. The book is, is absolutely fantastic. Uh, some of the photos that I'll show you tonight are a bit of a teaser for some of the imagery that's in the book and the stories are all in there. So it's, it's, a, it's a really, really great thing. Um, I've started, I put this, this photo of this little brown bat up here to start us off with. So this would be a, a good example of a bat that encompasses that, that science of bats idea. This is a species that we know a lot about. Little brown bat was at one time, probably the most common bat that we have here in Eastern Ontario through much of North America likely. It's been a huge amount of research on this bat. Uh, we know a lot about how this animal works and what it does. Uh, but I also picked this photo because this photo was taken 
my first experience working with bats. This was a photo that we took. Uh, so Brock Fenton, my PhD advisor, you're going to see a lot of his photos through here. He's a fantastic photographer, incredibly generous, and lets me use his photos to tell all these stories. I helped Brock get everything set up in an abandoned mine while we were getting ready to take these photos. And this is one of the photos that came out of my first experience working with bats. So it, it bookends my career with bats really, really nicely. If we jump to the other side, here's the mystery side of things. This is, this is the, the wrinkle-faced bat. So the other thing you're going to notice as I go through here is bat biologists are not particularly creative people when it comes to naming bats. Uh, the little brown bat is indeed little and brown, and the wrinkle-faced bat is a bat with a wrinkled face. Um, but it just, it, this, is, this is one of these animals. I've wanted to meet this bat for a very, very long time. You look at this bat and just, what the heck is going on there? What's with that face? What are they doing? And, and you know, just recently, the people actually started to work some of this out. This is actually a weird bat. This is a Central American bat. They're a frugivorous species, but they do something that not a lot of bats do. They actually, their mating system, they form a lek. So the males, in this case, this is a male here, they, they find a perch and they wait until a female comes by to check it out. And then they display, they do a song and they try and impress the female. And if she's impressed, then maybe she'll stick around and hang out for a bit. If not, she moves on and finds another male. And, and they do all kinds of weird things. You don't see it so much in this photo, but they've got a little pouch that can kind of cover their face up. They've got weird markings in their wings and all kinds of things that you wouldn't normally expect on a bat. Um, so they're really in interesting species. The most interesting thing that, that's total wild guess, completely untested, and who knows whether it's actually true or not, but all the wrinkles in the face, what's up with that? And the suggestion is that it might be, this is a, a frugivorous species, they eat fruit. So maybe when they chomp into a big piece of ripe fruit, maybe this is a bunch of channels that get all that delicious fruit juice down to their mouth. Who knows if that's actually the case or not, but it, you know, to the point of just the mystery and, and the things that we don't understand about these animals, um, this, is, this is one of them. And so I was actually really lucky, uh, again, with the book ending, Brock and, I was helping Brock take the photo of that little brown bat when I first got started with bats on the previous slide. I, I was there when Brock was taking this photo down in Belize when we were down and uh, doing some field work together just this past year. So it's, it's been a long, fun career of, of traveling around the world with Brock and seeing all these, these amazing animals. So the plan for today, I want to take that, that both the science and the mystery side of things and, and tell you a whole bunch of fun stories about bats. And I figure the who, what, when, where, why is probably the way to do that, right? So we're going to talk about what are bats, what are some of the neat bats, how do they evolve, and I hope by the end of it, I don't have to actually do much to convince you that you really should care about bats. Bats are really neat animals. Um, and there's, there's lots of really interesting things that we can learn about them. So that's, that's kind of my goal for tonight. So let's start with the, the, the what are bats question, right? So bats are mammals. They do all the things that you would expect a mammal to. They have fur. Uh, they have a high and stable body temperature, what we used to refer to as being warm blooded, same as you and I. Um, the mothers give birth to live pups. They nurse those pups. They produce milk to nurse the pups. They do all the, the typical mammal things. Uh, but specifically, they form their own order. They're the order Chiroptera within mammals. And this is a, actually a, a perfectly descriptive name. Uh, Chiro, coming from the root meaning hand, and Terra meaning wing. So bats are the hand wing mammals. And you see that in the, this, this beautiful illustration here in the middle. There's, there's our bat wing, and you can see how the wing is essentially just a membrane stretched across some really elongated fingers. So there you go. There's, there's the, my left hand is making that same bat wing right up there, right? So we have the, the shoulder, the wrist, the elbow, and then there's all five fingers that make the stretch that wing. Bats are also fascinating to think about and study because they're weird, right? They do things that mammals shouldn't do. They fly. But one of only three groups of vertebrates has ever evolved the ability for true powered flight. The other, of course, being birds and pterosaurs. And birds do things very differently. The morphology is completely different. They got bones that are fused. They got lots of feathers. And pterosaurs, their wing is formed out of that weird long freaky finger. Right? They've got one weird long finger that stretches all the way out to make the membrane for, for a pterosaur wing. So three completely different evolutions of the ability for powered flight. And bats are, are just one of the three groups that's done that. Uh, that order of Chiroptera, we split that into 21 different families. So lots of diversity within bats. That's a recurring theme tonight. Uh, some of those families only have a single species. Others have over 500 species. Uh, there's a lot of bats overall. Uh, this number keeps changing. I have to look this up every time I give a talk like this because the, the researchers are constantly describing new species. So as of about 3 o'clock this afternoon, there were 1,456 species of bats. Uh, that may have changed by now. Um, but that's a, that's a huge number. That makes up about 20% of all mammals are bats. And they're second only to rodents in that regard. There's a, there's a whole lot of mice and rats out there, but bats are better. 
So we can look at that hand wing a little bit closer on a, on a real photo of that. Uh, so again, this is our little brown bat. And you can see that, that hand wing, right? There's, there's the wing stretched out. They've got one, two, three, four fingers. One, two, three, four fingers in here. And they've got the thumb that sticks out the top, right? This is what bats use when they're climbing and grabbing onto things. They just got those thumbs that they can grab and climb with. That's, that's where they've got the claw. There's no claws on the rest of any of these fingers here. They're just these long elongated finger bones with the membrane stretched between. Um, most bats, not all bats, but most bats have a tail and have a membrane that connects that tail, adds an extra airfoil when they're flying. Uh, but as we'll also see here in a little bit, they can also use that as a scoop or a net to grab prey when they're, when they're hunting. And then a neat feature to help them maintain that airfoil, airfoil in flight, there's a little structure that comes right off the ankle here, a little bit of cartilage. That's called the calcar. This is a sort of rigid bit that helps to support that wing membrane um, when bats are doing things. The reason I show you that is because bats have been around for a very, very long time. This is uh, the oldest known fossil bat. This is a Nicanicterus finii uh, from about 52 and a half million years ago. This fossil was, was pulled from a formation in Wyoming. And uh, if you look at this fossil, you might have to take my word for it, but this fossil skeleton looks almost exactly like a bat skeleton now, right? Even 52 and a half million years ago, a bat was a bat. This is very clearly a bat, uh, has all the things that you would see. There's all the el elongated finger bones. There's that calcar that I was talking about right there. You can even see that in the preserved fossil specimen. Uh, another excellent name for uh, you know, being really creative, uh, anico meaning clawed and nycteris meaning bat. This is the clawed bat. Unlike modern bats, where all those fingers are elongated, the membrane stretches across, these guys are, are still somewhat primitive. They still have, I don't know if you can see it here, these little bits right here, those are the claws. They still had claws on all five fingers. So they are primitive in that sense. Um, but in modern bats, we only see the claw on the thumb or in one family, we see a residual claw on, on one index finger, but otherwise they're all gone. So bats have been around a long time. They've looked like bats for a long time. Where do we find them? Bats are pretty much anywhere that isn't permanently frozen over. So we don't have bats in the high Arctic. We don't have bats in Antarctica, but just about everywhere else we've got, we've got bats. Um, all major continents, even on remote oceanic islands, we've got bats that have, have moved in there. Uh, so Hawaii, for example, you know, the, one of the most remote land masses, uh, we've got one species of bat that lives there now. There's at least one fossil bat that's known from Hawaii. So at one point there was at least two species in Hawaii. Uh, and like many other things, species richness increases as you get closer to the equator. When you get to the tropics, there's many more species, right? So here in Ontario, we've got eight species of bats. Start going a bit south. If you get into New Mexico, one of my, one of my favorite places to do field work, uh, they've got 28 species of bats that you might come across in New Mexico. And if you get down into the, the neotropics and areas like in French Guiana, you might have 150 or so species of bats all sharing one, one space. So it can be quite a huge diversity within spaces. How big are they? probably smaller than you think. Uh, what you're imagining as a bat is probably too big. Uh, they come in all different sizes, but uh, there's, there are many of them are really quite small. Uh, photo on the left here is perhaps in the running for one of the smaller bats that I've ever come across. This is a Yuma myotis that I caught while we were doing some field work in New Mexico. Holding the bat in my hand, you can see the head poking out one end, the butt poking out the other, everything else is in between underneath my thumb. So it's a real small bat, weighs somewhere in about four or five grams. Other bats are even smaller. On the right, we've got a, a little banana bat sitting on Brock's thumb. These guys weigh you know, two, three, four grams. Uh, the question of how, you know, what's the smallest bat? It's actually one we can definitively answer. Smallest bat is Kitty's hognose bat, a species native to Southeast Asia. Um, you can go to Thailand and you can find these guys there. Right around about two grams. Uh, teeny, 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 tiny. Right up there in the running for the world's smallest mammal, it gets into splitting hairs, whether we're talking about size or body mass. There's some shrew people that would get into an argument. Um, bats are better. On the flip side, there are some bats that get really, really big. This is a trickier one to answer in terms of the biggest bat. There's a couple of contenders that are all sort of in the same conversation. Um, used to be an easier tie break. Uh, this is the Indian flying fox here formerly known as Taropus giganteus. And I figure if their species name is giganteus, that qualifies as the biggest bat. Uh, they've recently been revised. Turns out that's not actually the correct and proper name for it. The taxonomists have had their way. So it's now Taropus medius, which is not quite as dramatic, I don't think, but uh, real big, you know, one and a half kilos, wingspan of one and a half to two meters. So two meters, six feet, that's my wingspan, right? That's a six foot wingspan right there. That's, that's how big these bats are. Uh, and there's a few different species that are in the running. Uh, the Malayan flying fox would be another similarly sized. The black flying fox is another one. Uh, there's a few different species that are right up in about this range. And I've been lucky enough to actually get to work with one of them. This is the black flying fox. 
we were doing some work in Australia where there's a really interesting system there. Uh, these flying foxes have certain types of habitat they require. They're a uh, flower feeding bat, a fruit bat, nectar bat. And in the winter, there's only a couple of particular types of trees that flower. Those trees only grow in a few particular types of places. And those are the types of places that humans like to build cities and farms. So as it turns out, there's only about four or 5% of that original habitat left over. So these bats are missing out on the critical habitat they need in the winter. And many of these bats have now moved into cities and they're living in parks. And so we were working on this project as a, 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 a large collaboration, looking at this human wildlife conflict where the bats are moving into these cities and the people that live in the cities aren't super thrilled about it. Um, I think it's super neat. Um, but the question we were going after was, where are these bats going when they're, for, when they're living in these cities? Where are they going to find food? How stressed are they? What's it like living in a city for, for a large colony of these bats? So this is me releasing one of these guys to give you a bit of a sense of the size of a, of a black flying fox. There we go. Camera angle gives it, you know, it doesn't really do it justice, but at one point I was holding one of these guys that had its feet up on my collarbone and its nose and my belly button. So that's, that's the kind of size of bat that we're dealing with here. Uh, but they're, they're all packed into these parks in the cities. And you actually can see all these little dark spots up here. These are the, the other bats up in these trees. That's, that's where they're living. And they squawk and they make a lot of noise. Uh, and they, they, they really, you know, the neighbors aren't super thrilled about it. I think it's neat. So bats come in all sizes. They also come in all shapes, all kinds of different diversity. And this is, to me, one of the most exciting things about working with bats, all the wild and weird different ones that we get to get to work with. So we've seen some of these guys, right? We've got our, our flying foxes down over here. Uh, we've seen our wrinkle-faced bat up over here. There's our little banana bat. This guy up in the top right corner, that's uh, a false vampire bat. It's a terrible name. They're not actually vampire bats. There are vampire bats, and we'll talk about them. But this is the largest bat in the new world. Got about a one meter wingspan, so still a pretty respectable sized bat. Uh, these guys are carnivores. So they go out and they hunt mice and birds and other bats. That's what they eat. Uh, right next to that, we've got the bulldog bat, or otherwise known as the fishing bat. These guys have giant feet, really elongated toes, and they fly over the water. And they use their echolocation to detect the subtle little ripples of fish right below the surface of the water. And they scoop out these fish, and that's what they eat. Uh, down the bottom middle here, there's your hammer-headed bat. Uh, this is another one that has a fantastic scientific name. It's Hypsignathus monstrosus. Uh, that's a male. The female doesn't look nearly as, as monstrous. Males are, are the ones that are really bizarre looking here. That's a big giant resonating chamber. This is one of the other species of bats that uses this lecking mating system. So the males will each go find their perch and they'll use that resonating chamber to honk. And the females will come and check that out. And maybe they think that honk is attractive or maybe they won't go find another bat who's got a nicer honk. Uh, bottom left, we've got the cute little Honduran ghost bat, little white puffball with little yellow ears. They're one of many species of bats that actually makes their own home. They, they're a tent making bat. So these guys are uh, neotropics. They're, they're down uh, Costa Rica, down that way. They'll go find a big broad leaf uh, plant, get up underneath it and nibble off the ribs of that leaf so that it just sort of folds down it makes this nice little tent that five or six or eight of these bats can all line up in that tent and have a nice sheltered, perfectly safe place to, to hang out for the day. Uh, top middle, one of my favorite bats, that's our, our hoary bat. This is a, a bat we have here in Ontario. I'm gonna talk a little bit about them later on, but they're, they're a migratory species. So they're here in the summer and they fly south for the winter, which makes them, them really neat. Other bats in here, we're gonna talk about it in some more detail because we can't just look at a quick little picture. We gotta get into it. So we're gonna talk about sucker footed bats, and vampire bats and nectar feeding bats. Sucker footed bats is one of the most amazing convergent evolution stories. So on the left, I've got a photo of Spix's disc wing bat. This is a new world species, Neotropics. They roost in furled up Heliconia leaves. So as the plant grows the leaf, it's this tube of a leaf and eventually the leaf kind of opens up. While it's still just in that tube form, the bats go in there during the day. That's where they go and spend the day. How do you hang on to a slick surface you get suction cups on your wrists and ankles, like literal suction cups. Top right there is, is an image of the close-up of the suction cup of these bats. They get in and stick onto the inside of that leaf. Absolutely amazing. Even more amazing, they're not the only bats that have figured this out. Completely different family. Over in Madagascar, we've got sucker-footed bats that have come to the same solution to the same problem. Also living in furled up leaves, also with suction cups on their wrists and ankles. Very slightly different. In this case, they're not proper suction cups. They're using a method called wet adhesion. So 
In the same way you can take a piece of wet paper and stick it onto a pane of glass and it'll hold, that's what they're doing with these pads on their wrists and ankles to hold onto that surface. But the same basic solution to a same common problem in two completely different groups of bats is just absolutely amazing. Another neat bat that lives in a neat plant. This, this is a Hardwicky's woolly bat, Southeast Asia. These guys live in pitcher plants. So pitcher plants, of course, are famous in boggy kind of habitats where they are having a hard time getting nitrogen and other nutrients from the, the nutrient poor soil. So they've got these pitchers that are supposed to attract insects where they can get their, their nitrogen and whatnot from the insects. This particular pitcher plant is not particularly good at catching insects. Instead, it's co-evolved with this bat and the bat comes and hangs out inside the pitcher during the day. A fantastic example of a mutualism where the bat gets a nice safe place to spend the day. The pitcher plant has actually changed the morphology from the original closely related plants. The, the pitcher is actually elongated and the fluid of the digestive fluid level is quite a bit lower than in other plants. So that the bat, when it's in there, isn't dunking its head down into these digestive juices all day. The plant, what it gets out of this is all the nitrogen it could want from the guano of the bats. They come and hang out there. The bat goes out, flies around at night, catches lots of fun bugs, comes back, poops in the plant, the plant gets all the nutrients it needs. Fantastic mutualism. And of course we have to talk about vampire bats, right? This was not, I it would be unfair of me to get up here and give a bat talk and not talk about vampire bats. So there are in fact three species of vampire bats and yes, that's all they eat is blood. They are obligate sanguivores, that's all they eat is blood. Uh, this is the common vampire bat. Uh, they're actually really quite cute as babies. Uh, great strategy for these bats because there's lots of food out there, especially now that humans have come along and built farms with lots of cattle and cows and horses and donkeys and all kinds of other things. It's an all-you-can-eat buffet if you're a vampire bat. The downside is that blood is not particularly nutritious, right? The, the blood is very nutritionally dilute. So these bats have to eat a lot of blood to get the nutrients they need out of it. In a little less than a 30-minute feeding period, these bats may consume over 50% of their body mass. So if I'm, you know, if I'm 200 pounds, imagine me eating a hundred pound meal, right? That's, that's what these guys are up against. Extra problem, how the heck do you fly away after a meal that size? You can't. So these guys are world champion urinators. Within a minute or so of starting to feed on that blood, they're already urinating out the excess water. They've got amazing kidneys that can filter all the nutrients out and get rid of all that excess water so that they don't have to carry all that extra weight around so they can get away at the end of the meal. Um, unlike the, the vampires of, of TV and movies and whatnot, uh, these vampires, and incidentally, vampires from TVs and movies are named after the bat, not the other way around. Um, they don't bite and suck. They've got fantastically sharp incisors. They make a real precision incision, precision incision. Um, they've got anticoagulants in their saliva that cause the wound to just bleed and bleed and bleed. And they just lap it up like kittens. They're basically just little kittens. <laughs> Another amazing thing about vampire bats is they are extremely mobile on the ground. If you're walking around the ground underneath a, a horse or a cow or something like that, it becomes very dangerous. You don't want to get stomped. So unlike pretty much any other bat, these guys are really incredibly nimble on the ground. Um, and Dan Riskin and colleagues proved this when they got these vampire bats and put them on a treadmill and turned on the camera so I can show this video. As it turns out, the, the gait, the running gait of a vampire bat is unlike any other animal. It's a totally unique way of running. And the other amazing thing, the one and only mammal that's known to be able to use infrared vision, not vision, infrared perception. These guys can sense heat. So in the same way that a rattlesnake can sense the heat of a mouse that's running past, these vampire bats can do the exact same thing. They've got little pits in their nose leaf that detect that infrared radiation. That becomes really handy when you're a little vampire bat landing on a big giant cow, somewhere in there is some blood. Where do you make that incision? Where's the best spot to do that? Well, if you've got infrared sensitivity, you can figure out where there's a blood vessel very close to the surface, that's the place to go after. As you can see in the evidence on the morning after from this cow, they're very, very good at it. Okay, so what else do they eat beside blood? Uh, pretty much everything. There are so many species of bats that do so many different things. If, if it's out there, they probably eat it. We've got uh, species of bats that eat fruit. So here's, here's a, a, a bat that's eating a fig. In many systems, bats are really, really important seed dispersers. Uh, we've got bats that eat frogs. Here's a frog eating bat, right? Really highly specialized. They actually sit on a perch and listen to frogs calling and they've learned the calls of all the different frogs. So they know which of the frogs that are calling are poisonous and which ones aren't. 
This poses a real dilemma for the frogs because the male frog is calling, trying to attract a female, but at the same time, there's also a predator bat that's listening in. So how much do you sing to attract a female, but hopefully not attract that hungry bat? Makes a real, real challenging situation for the frogs. Bats are very good at what they do. Um, we've got species, there's our fishing bat right there. We already talked about them scoop fish across the surface of the water. There's a there's a several different species of bats that do this and they've all come to the basic same solution, have big giant feet and scoop things off the surface. Uh, we've got bats that feed on very, very large arthropods. Here's a pallid bat. These guys are, are native to the Western North America, especially down the desert Southwest. They think scorpions and centipedes are absolutely delicious. Better yet, they're actually immune to the venom of scorpions and centipedes. So they can hunt these guys and not worry about getting stung. We've got uh, many bats and certainly any bats that we've got in any temperate regions are eating insects. So we're gonna talk a bunch more about that. But the other one I wanna talk about right now is bats that feed at flowers. We have, we have a whole bunch of bats that are basically the nighttime equivalent of hummingbirds. One of those is Pallas's long-tongued bat. So again, with bat biologists not being particularly creative, Pallas's long-tongued bat is indeed a bat that has a very long tongue. Uh, very good for getting down deep in the flowers and getting that nectar. But it's better than that. Watch the video. At the very end, you see all these little feathery projections that stick off the tip of the tongue so they can grab lots of nectar volume in each, in each sip, right? They'll come up at nighttime and they'll hover in front of these flowers the same way a hummingbird would and stick their nose right in there and lap up all this nectar that's in these flowers. And there's actually a whole whack of different flowers that have co-evolved with these bats. So they actually flower at night. They produce nectar at night. The bats are the main target for these bats in terms of the pollinators for these flowers. In some cases, that coevolution has gone to absolute extremes. Um, this is, I love the name. This is a tube-lipped tailless bat. I guess it has lips like tubes and has no tail. Um, these guys are native to cloud forests in the Ecuadorian Andes, and they have co-evolved with this one flower. This is Central Pogon Niger, Kansas, is a flower. They are the sole pollinator for this flower. They're the only animal that can get down and get the nectar out of this flower because the flower has got to be so long and the bat's got so long this bat has the world record for the longest tongue of any mammal. Uh, the, their tongue is 150% of body length, so long that they have a problem. Where do they store it? it? Actually anchors down in the sternum, right? So if I'm almost six feet, no, I'm not gonna do the math. Um, <laughs> but yeah, amazing animals. The tongue goes all the way down in there. They, they, they this, this real specialized pollinator pair. But if we stick to our temperate regions, right? Almost uh, pretty much every bat that we've got in any temperate region is an insect feeding bat, right? Insectivorous bat. And what do they eat? So this is, uh, this is a bat, this is one of the photos of, uh, I took when we were doing some field work down at Long Point, and I'll talk some more about that in a bit. This is an Eastern red bat. That's a bat we've got here in Ontario. They're one of these neat species that migrates south for the winter. Um, so in this case, actually, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little radio transmitter on the back of the bat. There's the antenna coming off. So I'll tell you more of that story in just a little bit. But several years ago, uh, Beth Clare, uh, who's now at York University, did a really neat study where she collected the guano from these bats and ground it up and used DNA sequencing to figure out what's in the guano. What do these bats actually eat? Now, this was, this was quite a while ago. I bet you if she did the study again with modern techniques, she'd have an even longer list. But at the time, the list came out at 127 different species in the guano of these, of these bats. And many of those things were the expected things. They had moths and flies and beetles and mayflies and lacewings, all the kinds of things you might expect a nighttime flying bat to be feeding on. There's also ants. And spiders, that was an unexpected one, and a wasp. I don't know how the wasp got in there, but the bat actually got itself a wasp. So there, there's that. There's one notable absence in that list. And this is part of the downside of the job. I have to burst people's bubbles on a fair, fairly regular basis. There's no mosquitoes in there. People love to imagine bats solving all of their mosquito problems. It's just not the case. If you think about a mosquito, they're teeny tiny. If there's no meat on a mosquito, go find a delicious juicy moth. That's what you want. You got a mosquito problem, you want dragonflies. That's what you want. In any case. So how do these bats that are flying around in the dark, how do they find all of these insects? And this is the crux of Spallanzani's bat problem. Uh, Lazaro Spallanzani, Italian scientist back in the 1700s, was really curious and fascinated by this question of how do nocturnal animals make their way around in the dark, especially bats and owls. So Spallanzani went out, got himself some bats, got himself some owls, brought them back to the lab, covered all the windows up so it's pitch black, hung a whole bunch of chains from the ceiling. So the idea being, if you release the animal into the lab and it flies around, if it can make its way around, it's not gonna crash into those chains. If it can't figure out where it's going, you're gonna hear clang, clang, rattle, bing, bang, and know what's going on. 
So start with owls, owls are easy. Release an owl into the pitch black lab, crash, bang, boom, can't fly, can't figure it out. Put a teeny tiny little candle down on the corner, no problem. So owls are easy. Owls, they can see really, really, really well with just even tiny little light levels. That's what they're doing. Now take one of the bats, release them into the room, pitch black, and they fly, absolutely no problem. Okay, so now Spallon's eye says we gotta start doing some experiments. Let's figure out, are they using their eyes? So he blinds the bat, right? covers their eyes up so they can't actually see, and they still fly, no problem. So, okay, well, what else can we do? Plugs their ears up, and all of a sudden, these bats are crashing in all over the place, even refusing to fly. If they can't hear, they don't want to fly. So he's figured something out here, but he doesn't quite know what it is or what it means or how it works. But he's got this idea that hearing is somehow critical to flying around in the dark, and he gets this work out there and gets absolutely mocked for it. George Cuvier, who's another prominent scientist at the time, comes out and says, if we're supposed to believe that bats see with their ears, should we also expect them to hear with their eyes? Like, come on, man, you see with your eyes, you don't see with your ears. What the heck is this nonsense, right? And Spallanzani didn't have a comeback because he couldn't figure out what exactly was going on. That didn't come until the 1940s when Donald Griffin, as an undergraduate at Harvard University, happened to stumble across Spallanzani's bat problem and know that the physics department had an oscilloscope and put two and two together and realized these bats are producing ultrasonic sounds that we as humans can't hear. And they're using the echoes coming off those sounds. They're hearing those echoes and that's what's enabling them to fly in the dark. So at the time, this had no name. Griffin actually coined the term. Since there is no convenient term available to describe this process, I suggest the word echolocation. So now we have echolocation. We've solved Spallanzani's bat problem. So this is what it looks like. This is the echolocation of a little brown bat. Mentioned this is, this is a species we know a lot about. So this is a spectrogram. What we're looking at here on the horizontal axis is time. On the vertical axis is frequency, or the pitch of the sound. And I've drawn a big, thick black line across there. That's the limit of human hearing. So if you are very young and, and, and women tend to have a higher frequency hearing sensitivity than men, that's about the best you're gonna do. As you get older, that disappears and it falls off. These bats are well above that, right? This is sound that we cannot hear as humans. So if we were to play this back and you were to listen to this in a, in a frequency range that we could hear, these are downward sweeping frequencies, right? So it's sort of like, that's what we're looking at here. These are the echolocation calls that the bats are making. And if you look really close, you can actually see a few of the little echoes that are coming back to the bats. Very, very faint, but the bats ear, hearing is so sensitive, it can pick up those echoes and make sense of those to know what objects are in the area. So my impression is terrible. Let's show you the real thing in action. So this is a Mexican free-tail bat. A species I've, I've been fortunate enough to work with, a really, really neat animal. Uh, Nick Ristoff managed to convince a couple of these bats to fly in a wind tunnel so we could take these, these videos. So you've seen the bat fly along. This is now filmed in infrared. So as far as the bat's concerned, it's pitch black and it's been slowed way down so we can actually hear the echolocation of the bat. That's, that's echolocation in action. Mexican free-tailed bats are a species that people have been particularly interested in because one of the things that they do is roost in absolutely huge colonies. So working in Texas, there's colonies of Mexican free-tailed bats living in caves in Texas that have millions and millions of these bats. I was fortunate enough to spend some time working at some of these caves. Um, this, is, this is Frio Cave in Texas. This is the emergence. It takes hours, like four or five hours for all the bats to pour out of this cave. Uh, there are somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 million-ish bats, because how the heck do you count? I mean, you can try and one, two, three, who knows, right? There's a, there's a lot of bats. And one of the questions that people have asked is, okay, when all these bats are flying out, echolocation works great when there's one bat and one target that's flying by itself. But the other aspect of echolocation is these bats are absolutely screaming. It's really, really loud for many species. And this is one of those. So imagine flying and imagine if we all got up right now and just ran out that door, all screaming at the top of our lungs. Let's not do that, but you can't make any sense of it. And yet these bats seem to be doing it, except that they don't. If you get, uh, if people have gone in since and set up high, high speed cameras. If you watch this in slow motion, those bats are crashing into each other all the time. They're just really good acrobatic flyers. They can recover and they can keep moving. They're more or less just following taillights, following the crowd on their way out. They stick in a nice tight column though, because there are lots of predators that know that these bats are gonna come out every single night. 
So we'd be getting there and setting up and getting ready to go. And there's a great horned owl and there's a peregrine falcon and there's a red tailed hawk and they're all ready to come and have their dinner, right? So it's, it's a really neat system to work in. Okay, so echolocation allows these bats to make their way in the dark. They can travel around, they can find where they have to go. How do they find the prey? It gets even more sensitive. So here we've got uh, in this video, this little white blob, which will turn into a moth in just a second. This is a moth that's tethered to a piece of thread. We're gonna have a bat that's gonna come in. In this case, an Eastern red bat is gonna come in and attack and eat this moth. You're gonna hear the echolocation. So you hear the, uh, the echolocation calls, same as before, this is filmed in infrared. So as far as the bat's concerned, it's pitch black and it's slowed down so we can hear the, the, the frequencies of the echolocation in the audible range. And the bat's gonna come in. As the bat approaches the target, the time it takes for the sound to get to the moth and back again, as you get closer and closer and closer, that takes less time. So the calls get closer and closer together. And eventually you get what we call a, a terminal feeding buzz. The calls get so close together, it's bzz, right at the end as the bat's about to attack the moth. So take a look. You hear that feeding buzz. Let's do it again. This is too cool. Right, so the feeding buzz is right as it's about to attack the moth, grabs the moth and goes. The other thing, let's watch it one more time. It doesn't actually grab the moth with its mouth. It uses that tail membrane as a scoop, grabs the moth out of the air, bends down, grabs the moth, eats it, and takes off and continues flying, right? Little somersault and keeps on going. So this works really well, right? Bats can find their prey in the dark. They can hunt these moths, absolutely no problem. Moths, understandably, aren't so thrilled about this. Uh, over evolutionary time, many of these moths have actually developed ears. So they can now hear the bats coming. So this is strobe photography. All these little you know, dotted bits here, this is a strobe, uh, strobe light photograph. So that's a moth and you're seeing it as it's moving along its flight path. What's happening here is the moth's flying along and then we play a playback call of an echolocating bat. In this case, it's fairly quiet, suggesting the bat is quite far away. That's, that's played back at where the arrow is. So in both these cases, the moth's flying around doing moth things. Uh-oh, the bat coming. I don't think I wanna be here anymore. Let's just head off out of the way. So for the bat, that bat may never encounter this moth because the moth heard the bat coming and moved off to a different area where it might be a little bit safer. So that works well when the bat's farther away, but when the bat gets close, just gradually veering off is not gonna cut it. In this case, the, the playback is quite loud, suggesting the bat is very close and these moths go berserk, just plummeting to the ground, total erratic, evasive maneuvers, trying to escape that attacking bat. So you can do this yourself. Next summer, it's too late this year, next summer, go and find yourself a street lamp where there's a whole bunch of bugs flying around that street lamp. If you can get your hands on an electronic dog whistle, that works great. If not, just take out your keys and jingle your keys. Jingling keys actually produces a fair amount of ultrasound, and the moths that have ears will hear that ultrasound and you will see them go berserk. So you'll be able to tell right away when you jingle your keys, which of those moths have ears and which don't. The ones that don't are dinner. So most bats echolocate in the range of 20 to 50 kilohertz. That's the frequency of their echolocation calls, which not surprisingly then means that most moths have hearing in the range of 20 to 50 kilohertz. The moths can hear the bats that are coming. This sets up what's referred to as the allotonic frequency hypothesis. Allo meaning different, tonic meaning sound. So if these bats can produce sound at a different frequency from what the moths can hear, then they will be able to go and attack these moths and the moths will never hear them coming. And this is borne out in a number of systems, but this is an example from a community of bats in South Africa. What we've got here is the frequency on the horizontal axis that the bat echolocates at, and the vertical axis is telling us what proportion of that bat's diet is made up of moths. So those bats that echolocate at the frequencies that moths can hear, that 30, 40, 50 kilohertz, they don't eat moths. They eat other things that don't hear them coming. But as you start to get out of that frequency band where the moths can really hear, now we start getting more and more moths in the diet. And if you get way out, so this species out here becomes a moth specialist. Moths cannot hear this bat coming and they make up about 60 or 70% of the diet of this bat. The moths have no defense against this bat. The bat can go and just chow down and have a great time. So this sets up the, the bat moth arms race, right? Over evolutionary time, the bats want to eat the moths. The moths don't want to get eaten. And we go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So here's a couple of bats that have figured out that allotonic frequency situation. We've got spotted bats are found out in Western North America. They've got an echolocation frequency that's actually audible, 10 kilohertz. I've never been lucky enough to actually meet one of these bats in person, 
but I've fallen asleep camping in the desert, listening to them fly overhead. You can hear them, ping, ping, ping. That's the best way to know if they're around is just listen, you can hear them, they're audible, but the moths can't hear them. On the flip side, we've got a, a trident bat here, so-called for that, that little trident nose leaf they've got. They've gone the other way. They've gone to extreme high frequencies. Again, the moths can't hear them. These guys are moth specialists. Okay, so what do moths do? They don't wanna get eaten. Many of these moths then, they eat pretty noxious plants in the caterpillar phase when they're larvae, right? And they incorporate some of those toxins. So you know the idea from monarch butterflies, right? Monarchs are toxic. Same basic idea for a moth. For a monarch, it works great because they're brightly colored. You can see, oh, I shouldn't eat that. It's toxic. It's nighttime. It's dark. How does the moth let the bat know that I taste really bad? These moths have evolved to produce ultrasounds. They can send a warning signal to let the bat know, hey, you don't want to eat me. The moths have ears. They hear the bat coming. They produce a sound back to the bat. Hey, you don't want to eat me. So this is the sound producing organ over here. This is the timbal. It's basically like running your fingers across a comb, except that it produces ultrasonic frequencies. Again, slowed down so we can hear it, but in real time, that produces ultrasound that the bats can hear. So now we've got one of these moths that can produce sound back at the bats that's tethered, and the bat's gonna come in. Listen this time, you'll hear the echolocation from the bat, and then you're gonna hear a little scritching sound. That's the moth saying, hey, 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 rethink your life's choices. Smart bat, right? Go find something else. Now, it gets even better. We, we could go on this for a while. There are some moths that are actually perfectly delicious and they try and trick the bats and some of the bats that actually figure that out. So they'll make some scratching sound. The bats, nah, 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 I'm on to you. <laughs> One more moth that has gone to absolute extreme. This is Groats Bertoldia. This moth has gone totally off the deep end in terms of the sound that it produces back at the bat. In this case, they're not producing a sound to warn the bat they're producing so much sound, they actually jam the bat's echolocation. So here's the bat echolocating, right? Call, 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 call. Moth gets involved and it produces this just total wall of sound. So now the bat's still echolocating and trying to attack the moth, but it's interfering with the echolocation. And the bat can't quite position the moth in space, still tries to attack and just barely misses it. You'll hear it. It tries and misses. You also notice it never got that feeding buzz that we saw in the other one, right? It, it starts a feeding buzz, but then loses where the moth is and tries again and loses where the moth is. Can't quite figure it out. The moths actually jammed the echolocation of the bat. So, I mean, we could talk about bats and moths all night, but we got to talk about other things. Um, one of the other things that I think that's really amazing about bats, and one of the things that we spend a lot of time thinking about in my lab, is that many bats, and especially bats that live in temperate regions, are able to use something called torpor. So bats, as I mentioned, are what we used to refer to as warm blooded, right? They've got a, a body temperature about 37 degrees, same as us, except that they don't always maintain that high body temperature. They're small little animals. It costs them a huge amount of energy to try and stay warm in an otherwise fairly cold environment. So sometimes they just say, you know what? I don't need to stay warm. And they allow their body temperature and metabolic rate to drop, saving a huge amount of energy. And then they warm back up again when it's time to be active again. So this is a silver-haired bat that we were studying, uh, another migratory species. In this case, we were looking at these bats, trying to understand how their ability to use torpor saves energy when they're not actually flying and migrating. They can basically shut down, and then the next night they can wake back up and get going again. So this bat here, we're looking at the temperature of the bat, and I've marked off sunrise and sunset. The bat finished doing whatever it was going to do the night before, and body temperatures drops down to right about ambient temperature, and then it just tracks ambient temperature through the day, and the following evening, right at sunset, the bat warms back up, back on the road again, right? This bat spent almost no energy that day by shutting its body temperature down, using torpor to save a huge amount of energy. We'll come back to those guys. The other situation where torpor is really, really handy is what do you do in the winter, right? It's really, really cold and there are no insects around in temperate regions. So many of these bats hibernate. So this is um, some, some band recovery. You can catch a bat, you can put a little band on their forearm. And if you catch that bat again, you know connecting the dots, right? You can figure out where it was and now where it is. In this case, this is data showing band recoveries in and out of a cave in Vermont. This is Aeolus Cave. Um, 
couple hundred thousand bats historically, or tens of thousands at least, uh, in this cave in the winter. And they come from all over, right? They migrate in in the winter and then back out in the summer. This, this cave is an important hibernation spot. So again, here's one of our little brown bats. This is some, some, uh, some data we did from a, a study where we had bats we brought into captivity to study this hibernation in captivity. They can drop their body temperature down to just about ambient, saving a huge amount of energy, but they have to periodically warm back up to their normal body temperature. So that's what we're looking at here. They drop their body temperature down, warm back up for a bit, drop back down, warm back up for a bit, drop back down. And they do this every few weeks throughout the winter. They got to get a drink. They got to go and take a pee. They got to do all the things that we do when we get up in the middle of the night, except they're doing it every two or three weeks or so. Um, in extreme cases, I, I did some work in central Manitoba where some of these bats actually hibernate for up to nine months of the year, right? It's a really, really long time. And those, those arousals happen every few weeks. So they spend the vast majority of their time in torpor, a very short amount of time actually aroused, but the energy required to warm back up and stay warm in those cold hibernacula takes up about 90% of the total energy required to hibernate. So these bats have to manage those arousals. If they arouse too frequently, they're gonna run out of energy and starve by the end of the winter. So they can figure this out. They can be adapted to their different regions and get what they need to get the, through the winter. And that works reasonably well until something comes along and throws things out of whack. Uh, this is where white nose syndrome enters the, enters the chat. Um, white nose syndrome is a fungal pathogen. This is a fungus that invades bats, uh, wing tissues and ear tissues and other things. Uh, it's a disease that's endemic to the old world and somehow got introduced into New York state. More than likely somebody went and visited a cave in Europe, got some fungus on their boots, came back to North America, went and visited a cave in New York and transferred that fungus to that cave. And then all hell broke loose from there. Um, so it's a cutaneous fungal infection. It's a weird fungus that grows really, really well at the cold temperatures that bats like to hibernate at and causes all kinds of problems. Essentially it causes these bats to arouse more and more frequently burning through those fat stores too quickly and they starve and die. In species that are particularly sensitive, been well over 90% mortality, right? So these populations in just a couple of years have crashed almost nothing. Um, the fungus is now found on 20 different species across North America and the progression, it's just moved all the way across. It's essentially across most of North America now. There are still some pockets that haven't been affected yet but it's, it's only a matter of time. And it's especially frustrating because, again, more data from little brown bats. This is one of the bats we know a lot about. Prior to the arrival of white nose syndrome, all the evidence we had would have suggested the bats were actually doing really well and populations were actually growing. This is data from a whole bunch of different hibernacula where people have gone in and done surveys and counted how many bats year over year. And the populations all seem to be growing and growing and growing and growing. This is really, really great. And then white nose arrived and all of those populations just absolutely crashed. So... Major concern, serious problem, um, really, really tricky thing to work on as a biologist where the animals you study all of a sudden are just strewn across the ground, just dead bodies everywhere, right? It's, it's, it takes a lot out of you. So my lab, we've done a lot of work trying to figure out and understand what's going on with hibernation generally, but with white nose syndrome in particular. Uh, we've done studies trying to understand how does white nose syndrome actually kill bats? Like what's actually happening? Does that maybe give us some insight into something we could do about this? Uh, are there any possible treatments? We've tried different things. Uh, we had a crazy idea at one point that we might be able to put a kiddie pool of Pedialyte in a cave and that might help. It didn't. Bats don't like to taste of Pedialyte. Um, how are different species affected? We know little brown bats are one of these species that's been really dramatically affected. Populations are way, way, way down. So little brown bats, northern long-eared bats, eastern small-footed bats, all these species have been now listed as endangered because of this disease. Other species don't seem to be as affected. They're down a little bit, but not terribly so. What's different? If we can understand what's happening with these different species, that might give us some insight. Um, not gonna get into it tonight, but I think water loss has a lot to do with it. But also as the, as the disease moves further west, there are species that haven't yet been exposed. Are there particular species we should be especially concerned about? We've done some work looking at that. How do the bats and the fungus respond to environmental conditions? Right? We have two different species involved in this, this interaction. Maybe there's some combination of environmental conditions that might give the bats a bit of an edge over the fungus. We've done some work in that area. But more and more now, what we're working on in my lab is trying to look at what happens with the bats that survive. Uh, when we first started working on this, back in, in you know, 2010, when people were first realizing what was going on, there was very real concern that all these bats were just gonna go completely extinct. And fortunately, that hasn't happened. There are remnant populations in these regions that still persist, some tiny fraction of what they used to be, but they're still there. So in my lab, we're doing a couple of different things now, trying to understand what's different now, what's going on with those bats. Um, I've got Gwyn's 
back in the back row there. Uh, one, of, one of her projects right now that she's working on is trying to understand what's changed about the way that bats uh, prepare for hibernation now that they have to deal with white nose syndrome every year. And Lily's up there as well. Lily's working on what happens in the spring when these bats are emerging. They survived winter. Now what? How do they deal with that immediate spring energetic bottleneck where it's still cold, there's not much to eat, but they're in a really bad way having survived a winter with white nose syndrome. So that's some of the stuff that we're working on there. But the other area that I think that's, that's really, really fascinating with bats is migration, right? We know the bats are able to fly, but they fly long distances. And that gives many bats the option, instead of stank, sticking around and hibernating, they can just fly south for the winter. There are a few species that do this, like this Eastern red bat. So what do these bats do? We really don't know. Getting into this, we knew almost nothing, even just basic natural history. We don't know what's going on with these bats. It's really tricky to track an animal that could be anywhere on the landscape and then just takes off and it's gone, right? How do you study that? So for a long time, people didn't really worry about it too much because it was really tricky to get into. But um, for reasons I'll talk about in a second, I got into it. So one of the ways that we do this is we use uh, some interesting radio tracking technology. And I'll show you that in a second, but here's the radio transmitter glued onto the back of this bat. So again, Brock takes fantastic photos for us. There's the radio transmitter and the antenna coming off of that. That's how we can track where these bats are going during these migratory periods. So this brings us to the problem of wind energy. This is why we really need to know what's going on with these migrating bats. As wind turbines started getting spread across the landscape, lots of things that we really like about, about wind energy, right? Clean, green, renewable energy, lots to like about it. One major downside is for reasons that still aren't entirely clear, wind turbines kill a lot of bats, especially migrating bats, especially during fall migration. Um, estimates vary depending on how you calculate it, but 500, 600, 700,000 bats a year in North America. And then you add on Europe and Asia and all, all the other regions of the world. There are huge numbers of bats that are killed by wind turbines every year. Is that a problem? We have no idea because we know nothing about these bats. So uh, I was involved in a group that was coordinated by the US Fish and Wildlife Service where we all got together and said, okay, let's figure out what we do know and try and figure out is this actually a problem? Let's, let's take the best available evidence we've got and we can do a bunch of modeling scenarios to see what's the realistic scenario here that might be, might be happening. Um, much like white nose syndrome and, and all to our, to our more frustration, if we don't consider the mortality from these, from these wind turbines, our models actually suggest in the blue line here that the populations are actually increasing over time. Suggest these bats are actually doing quite well. But when you start layering on a couple hundred thousand dead bats every year, the population, the red line here, starts to decline very, very rapidly. So we ran a whole bunch of different modeling scenarios to account for things that we did or didn't know. And the most likely model outcome was that we'd look, we're looking at about a 90% population decline in these guys over the next 50 years. That's a scary number. Uh, the scarier thing to me is that in every single modeling scenario we ran, except for the absolute most optimistic scenario, we get essentially the same answer. So if we take the absolute best case scenario and we assume that everything is well with the world, then maybe these guys are okay. Every other way we look at it, there's a real problem here that we need to figure out what's going on. So one of the ways that we're doing that is looking at how these bats are moving across the landscape, where they're going, where they're moving. Um, <clears throat> and the way we're doing that is using this, what's called the MODIS wildlife tracking system. So this is an open source collaborative network that I'm involved with. Um, when I first started working with this, there was five towers just down here in Southern Ontario. It's grown hugely. There's now over 1500 stations in over 30 different countries. Each one of these towers is a radio tracking antenna tower that's listening for anybody's animal. So if there's an animal that's got a radio tag on it, that tower is listening for it. So if my bat shows up at somebody else's tower, then I will get that information. And if somebody else's bird shows up on my tower, they're gonna get that information. So now we can track these animals all across the movements uh, across the continent. So if you got a chance, go check out modus.org. There's some really, really neat stuff there. So one of the ones that we've looked at is silver-haired bats. So that's the one I was showing you earlier. They're one of our, our latitudinal migrants that go south for the winter. And we'd done some previous work before the MODIS network had exploded, looking at Long Point. So Long Point is here on the north shore of Lake Erie. It's this beautiful peninsula. If it wasn't covered up by all these dots that are the towers, you'd see it's a beautiful funnel. So during fall migration, all these animals get funneled out on the peninsula. So it's a great place to actually catch these animals. And we'd done some tracking work. And what came out of that was with our limited scope that we could look at, it looked like about half of the animals when we released them flew across the lake to continue on going south. And the other half said, nope, turned around and went back and probably followed the lakeshore to go the long way around. 
So we got back now when we have all of these towers. Now we can actually look and see it at a broader scale what's going on. This work was actually motivated and funded with concerns about offshore wind energy. I want to put wind turbines out in the lake. And at the time, there were folks who had suggested, well, of course, everybody knows that bats don't fly over open water. So does everybody know that? Let's go figure it out, right? So this is what we're doing. We're tagging bats at the bird observatory right here at that arrow. We're going to see where they go. Southbound, fall migration. We're expecting about half of them to cross the lake and continue on going south, and the other half to turn around and go back along the lake shore. And every once in a while, when you're working with wildlife, they're really incredibly you know, accommodating and cooperative. We had a bunch of bats that took the time and were courteous enough to actually read the proposal and did what we had told them to do. So here we've got examples of three bats that actually went across the lake, moving south the way we expected them to, right? So we tag the bat at the bird observatory, follows the length of the peninsula and jumps across. This one here moves partway down the peninsula, jumps across. This guy here took the long way, but still going across the lake, right? So there's your answer to the wind turbine problem. Yeah, absolutely. These bats are flying out over open water. So this is definitely something we need to be aware of and be thinking of. Uh, we had another group of bats, similarly, took the time to read the proposal, turned around and went back around the lakeshore, right? So started going partway out the peninsula, said, nah, I don't like the look of this, turn around and go back around. Another bat here that turned around, went back around. Then we've got some bats that sort of skimmed the proposal. They didn't really do all of the work, but yeah, yeah something, something lakeshore got, got, got it. Except they got the wrong lakeshore. This is southbound fall migration. They should be going south. And yet they turn around, they're going north along the north shore of Lake Ontario. This is one of the amazing things with this, this, this tracking network. I would never have expected this. And I still don't entirely understand what's going on here or why they're doing this, but it's weird. Not as weird as the bats that just couldn't be bothered and did whatever the hell they wanted anyway. <laughs> here we've got a bat on the left, southbound fall migration, tagged it, turned around and it flew all the way up north up to Tobermory on the tip of the Bruce Peninsula. And then turned around and came all the way back down south again. And then said, yeah, I'm gonna go back up north a little bit. And eventually made its way down around the western edge of Lake Erie. So here's a bat that's supposed to be going south and went 300 kilometers north and then back and then a little bit more north and then finally started making its way south. Similar thing in the bat on the right, all the way up the Bruce Peninsula coming back down. So if we think that these are bats that are probably going somewhere between 1500 kilometers between where they spend their summer and where they spend their winter, here's an animals that have sped six, seven, eight, 900 kilometers, and yet really haven't got a whole lot farther than where we initially tagged them. So these guys are covering a huge amount of ground during fall migration, which potentially puts them at risk of experiencing many, many different wind energy facilities, and sometimes maybe even repeatedly so across the landscape. That might be part of the problem. Why are they doing this? We don't know. Uh, one guess is the fact that they can use torpor every day. They don't need to spend a hum huge amount of energy during the non-flight periods. So maybe they can do this because they have the energy. They can go exploring. They can wander around. They can find friends. They can scout new spots for next year. They're not as constrained as an animal that might be really, really tight energy budget. that has got to get to the wintering grounds right away. By being able to use torpor every day, these bats may be able to go and do more of this exploring. So that's... That's it. That's that. That's the that's the science and the mystery of bats. You know, doing really cool science, and we're learning about the way these animals are moving with and interacting with the landscape. And the more we dig into it, the more mystery we uncover, and still trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Right? It's it's as we dig in more and more, we just find more and more questions. New new animals, new studies. There's there's always more questions that we're going to keep going with, which is one of the things that I I find the most exciting about all of this. So. Thank you very much to everybody for coming out tonight, whether you're here in person or online. I uh, hope you enjoyed some of the stories. I've got to make sure I thank a huge number, but one of the best parts of this job is the people you get to work with, right? I've got you know fantastic students that I work with, collaborators and colleagues that make this a lot of fun. Uh, we've got some fantastic funding agencies that support this work that enable us to go out and do these kinds of things. Um, it's, just, it's just a great team that we get to work with uh, through all this work. So thanks very much to everybody that's contributed to all this work that I've talked about tonight. With that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Oh, is my mic on? Okay. Thank you. So that was great, Liam. Um, I think my favorite bat is the pitcher plant one. <laughs> um, I probably could have predicted that. Um, okay, so we have time for questions now. I do see we have a, a couple that are in the chat, but first I'll open it up to the room here. Are there any questions from anyone in the room? 
Yes. So the question is, if you plug their ears, can they still fly around? One of the ears. That's a good question. That's an excellent question. Spilans, and he did that. <laughs> uh, so yes, it, it's exactly what he did. When he did these studies, he first plugged both ears. They just refused to fly. You plug one ear, they kind of try. They still crash into things. They, they, they can hear a little bit, but they need to have hearing from both sides. That's how they can get the directionality figured out. So they really need both ears to figure out what's going on. Right, that probably wouldn't get past ethics today. We don't need to go into how no, exactly we he won't. did these studies. And there was another <laughs> question over here. Yes. I was wondering what the progress was being made with the white nose syndrome. Is there any way of, of uh, putting something new or perhaps uh, hibernate so that uh, this uh, fungus doesn't uh, grow or get dies off or whatever? Yeah, so the question is, is what's the current state of, of dealing with white nose syndrome, is there anything that we've figured out that we can do about it? Um, it's a really tricky situation to deal with. Uh, the fungus persists in these caves and mines all by itself during the summer months. So when the bats come back the following season, the fungus is there waiting for them. And there's really no effective way of getting rid of it. Um, the bats themselves are also fantastic at sharing the fungus all amongst each other. So they spread it really well. Uh, lots of different things that people are looking at. We've tried all kinds of different things. We, the, the research community, is there some sort of a probiotic we can inoculate these bats with? Is there some sort of ultraviolet light we can, we can kill the fungus with? Is there some sort of a, a gaseous emission that we can use that would kill the fungus but not harm the bats? Can we feed them Pedialyte that might enable them to survive some of the, the worst symptoms of this? So far, none of them have worked out. There's groups that are working on if there's some kind of vaccine which runs into all the problems of how would you actually administer the vaccine to all these bats. Um, there's groups that are working on whether we can set up UV lights outside of hibernacula to at least set up an all you can eat buffet to help these bats get really fat to survive the winter. That seems to show some promise. Um, it's, it's a really tricky situation because there, there's nothing really that we've, we've hit on that we can really do about this. So that's where a lot of the research community is pivoting more towards these remnant populations, these bats that have survived there's something about them. So in, in many ways, this might just be a really strong evolutionary selective sweep that the bats that have the traits that enable them to survive the disease are now the bats that are forming the population. So best we can do to support those bats to persist, that might be the best that we can do right now. Okay. Uh, so at a micro level, yep. people who have uh, the uh, bat, what we call bat lodges, yep. you know, where they so would you suggest that they try sanitizing if with something, uh, if, if, you know, during the day when all the bats are out, so that when the winter comes, they can they can go in and uh, this fungus won't be there. So the question is, if you've got a bat box or a bat lodge that the bats are living in, is it a good idea to sanitize that to try and give the, the bats a bit of a helping hand? Um, you can, you can, you can, you can sterilize it with some just dilute bleach or something like that. I wouldn't do it when the bats are still around because you don't want the bats exposed to the bleach themselves. But they don't always all go out. That's the trick, right? So, so there are very few bats that will actually spend the winter in those boxes. They're mostly going to move to a cave or a mine. So that would give you a chance to, to disinfect the box. The problem is the bats leave the cave or the mine infected and they come straight back to the box. So there are, there are people who've gone out and they've swabbed bat boxes and you find the fungus in the bat boxes. It's probably not a problem in the bat box though, because in the summer, those boxes are nice and warm. The bats are nice and warm. The fungus doesn't grow when it's warm. The fungus grows when it's cold. Okay. So the fungus doesn't seem to cause much problem in the summer. It's in the caves and the mines in the winter. That's where it causes the problem. Great. Megan, uh, some questions online? I, uh, I can't tell this person is real, but uh, are the bats exposed to dark matter or are my hips exposed to cold matter? Okay. Ah, I think that's something we should save for dark matter trivia next. Okay. Yes. That's good. But Okay, the question was, how can I attract a bats to a bat box in my yard and they're not using it? It's tricky. Um, it's especially tricky because there are not many bats left around here, unfortunately. White nose syndrome has done a really good job of knocking populations back. There are a couple of things that you can do. Uh, most bat boxes that you find that are, are sold in most commercial kits are actually terrible bat boxes. Uh, they're far too small. Bats need to have a nice temperature gradient in those bat boxes. So if you've got a bat box that's about this big, not going to work real well. You want a bat box that's this big, which not everybody's super thrilled about. 
Um, but the best thing to do is if you go to the Bat Conservation International website, batcon.org, they've got some great recommendations for the best, best practices to give you the best chance of attracting bats, as, bats to a bat box, especially given where you live, right? Depending how far north you are, or how far south, maybe you want the box to be south facing or north facing or dark colored or light colored to get that right temperature gradient for the bats. The trick, of course, is that these bats are so small, little brown bats, their skull is the limiting factor. So if I can stick my pinky finger through an opening, they can get in. So pretty much everybody's attic and barn and boathouse and shed is a perfectly suitable roost for these bats. So you're competing against that. So it's not, not that it's not going to happen, but it sometimes it's a bit of, bit of luck. You just, there's things you can do to give yourself a better chance, but just stick it out there and hope for the best. That's great. Yep. Okay, so the question is, are there uh, sounds that can be sent off from wind turbines uh, to prevent bats from hitting them? Yep, so this is um, an area of active research right now where folks that are looking at this kind of active mitigation. Is there some kind of an ultrasonic pulse that we can broadcast from these wind turbines that might deter the bats? Um, some promising results, some mixed results. Uh, the, the problem is the ultrasonic frequencies that the bats can hear attenuate really, really rapidly in the atmosphere. They don't transmit over long distances, you know, a few meters at most. So probably by the time the bat's gonna hear that signal, they're already too close to the turbine. What's also promising though, is, uh, is more operational mitigation. So first of all, bats aren't flying during the day. Run the turbines, no problem. Bats aren't flying when it's super high wind speed. It's too windy for them. Run the turbines, absolutely no problem. When it's lower wind speeds, when the bats might be more active at night, during fall migration, that really narrows when we have an issue. There's, there's groups now that are working on putting a bat detector on these wind turbines. And when they start detecting some critical threshold of echolocation calls, then they shut the turbines down for a block of time until those bats pass through and then fire them back up again. So there are ways of reducing mortality dramatically. So the problem right now is working with industry to actually get them to implement these things. This, is, this, this has become a policy issue, not a science issue. Great, thank you. Any other questions in the room here? Yes. Thank you so much. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, you said about how the, um, the noises that make stuff on bat ships and then go on the roads. Is there a reason and do all bats do that? Excellent question. So the question is the echolocation calls the bats make. The example I gave you started off high pitch and came down to low pitch, right? Many bats do that, not all bats do that. There are some that have a constant frequency. There are some that have a slightly rising pitch. As many different species of bats, there's that many different types of echolocation. The, the, the trick though, is that the broader the bandwidth, the better the spatial resolution they can get. Different frequencies attenuate at different, uh, at different rates. So by having high, medium and low pitch sounds, they can get really good spatial resolution. So some of these bats can actually tell the difference between 60 grit and 80 grit sandpaper just with their echolocation, right? It's really, really, really sensitive, but having that broad bandwidth really gives them the ability to do that. So whether you're starting high and going low or starting low and coming up, most bats though that, that, that we would look at are probably that high coming down situation. Any other questions here in the room? Yes. So the question is, is why is there seeming a lack of research about bats? Is there something about the nature of bat research or something that makes it tricky? Um, so I would actually argue there's actually quite a lot of research. Um, we were just at a, a conference this summer for the International Bat Research Conference, and we had 600 and some odd bat biologists from around the world that came out to, to share their research. So there's, there is a, a fantastic community of bat researchers, but there are practical challenges. Um, bats are out at night. They're hard to find. They're really hard to catch many of them. The species like little brown bats that we know where they roost, we know where they live. They live in places where there are people who have active research programs going on. We know quite a lot about them. There's a real paucity of research in the global south, right? There's, there's major, major gaps in terms of, of resources and, and, and training and whatnot. So there's, there's a real push on right now. Um, there's actually a, a group that I've just, just recently been coordinating with, uh, Global South Bats, trying to increase capacity in the global south so that we can fill some of these knowledge gaps. 
Um, so there's, there's, there's a ton more that we can learn. There's a lot more that we can do. Just there's only, yeah, there's only so many of us. Good. Is there another question online? Okay. Is it a dark matter question? Okay. Okay, so this is a question that uh, from an eight and 10 year old that would like to know bats do hang upside down in caves like they do in the movies. Bats absolutely hang upside down. That's what they do in the cave, on a tree, in a, in a bat box, in your attic, anywhere they go. In a picture plant? Sorry? Are they upside in the picture plant, in absolutely, picture yeah. Plant. The, the, the photo we had there, a little brown blob, but it's upside down in the picture plant. Um, what the, but the, the, the amazing follow-up to that though is how do they do it? So imagine that you're trying to hang on with your hands, right? This, go rock climbing. How do your fingers feel? It takes a huge amount of energy and effort, right? Your fingers get exhausted. Bats have an amazing ratcheting tendon locking mechanism. For these bats, the closed position is actually the relaxed position. They have a ratcheting tendon that locks that in. So they're not actually holding on. That's just what they do. They actually have to flex their muscles to release their toes to let go and take off. So when the bats are hanging upside down, it costs them no energy. It's super easy and comfortable and relaxed for them. They just have to go whoop, to let go and get going again. But that's, that's how they do it. Yeah, next question. So the question was, could the facial features have the same impact as the ears and affect how they're hearing that sound? So we got bats like our ghost face bat here is all kinds of weird things going on in the face. I assume this is the question, right? Why the heck does this bat look like this? Um, I think that's kind of where we're going, or the, or the nose leaf on some of these bats. So the facial features are not so much thought to affect the reception of sound so much as the production of sound. So can we use the features around the face and around the mouth to actually focus the echolocation beam on the target? And then they've got really flexible ears. They can actually adjust the shape of the ears They've got a big tragus that can help to focus the, and capture the right frequencies of sound. So the facial features are helping to send the outbound signal and then the, the weird structure of the ear. That, that's a weird looking ear, right? Uh, so the ears help to actually get the right sounds coming back again. So they're, they're both working in combination. Could it also be that female bats might like some of those facial features? I mean, I wouldn't put it past them. Okay. Uh, the tricky okay. thing though is that it, 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 it's, for bats, it's dark most of the time. So visually what they see is probably not most of what they're making the decision on. So we've got bats that I should have, I should have told you about sack wing bats. <laughs> sack wing bats are, are another really, really amazing species. Males actually have a little weird pouch in their wing and they put saliva in there and they put urine in there and they put feces in there and they ferment it all together. And it makes this glorious cocktail that drives all the lady sack wing bats crazy. To the point where the male sack wing bats go out and they sing, which attracts these females in, and the male actually flicks his wings and some of that delicious juice flicks out towards the females. And then she says, oh man, I gotta go and hang out with this guy some more. And the males form a harem based on that. This is why I love biology and evolution. <laughs> <laughs> I told you this was a four hour talk when I first put this together. <laughs> I can really see that. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> okay, comment from the audience. That's the most romantic thing they've ever heard. Yes. So the question is, is when they're relying more on sound as, the, as their sensory perception, less on vision. So first of all, bats aren't blind. They can actually see just fine. Um, some species can see quite well, but in the dark, they do rely on, on sound mostly. Um, how do they tell a potential prey item separate from a predator or, or a brick wall, for example, right? So part of it is just the, 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 the resolution of the echolocation. They can tell just by shape that something is about the right size and about the right shape. They can also tell that it's moving. And there are some bats that actually are able to use the Doppler effect. And so they can actually tell if there are flapping wings the returning echoes get a little bit higher frequency, a little bit lower frequency, a little bit higher frequency, a little bit lower frequency. So they can actually pick up on flutter. And so they can tell a, a leaf that's just kind of dangling on a branch from a moth that's fluttering its wings in a really crowded space. It's amazing. Another question from online? Two more? Uh, 
Yes. Okay, moth flavored Pedialyte. Yep. So when we did that study, we uh, we decided we didn't really want to be feeding bats the super sugary Pedialyte that you might feed to your kids if you were nicer to them. You can get unflavored Pedialyte if you want to be mean to your kids. And that's what we used. If you've ever tasted it, it tastes awful. So I don't blame the bats. So in the future, we probably should find some way of flavoring moth it. Flavoring such a way. Moth flavoring Pedialyte. is not a bad idea. Yeah. Okay, and the question? So how is climate change impacting bat populations here in Ontario? So climate change is, is, is one of these really complex issues, right? It, it changes. It's, it, we're not just warming up. There's lots of things that are going on. So different, I mean, there's lots of ways that we can think of this. One of the ways is in many regions, um, it's becoming much more arid. Bats are having a harder time finding water. As a, as a mammal that needs to produce milk for their offspring, there are, there are regions of the West that are getting so arid that females aren't able to find enough water and they, can't, no, they can no longer lactate sufficiently to, to nurse their pups. So that's a problem. Um, extreme climate events. Now you see some of these, these storms coming through, some of these hurricanes, some of these, uh, what was it, the, the Roche, what did we call it? The, the, the Roche or whatever that storm was that came through this year. Yeah, yeah, that one. So, so something like our, our Eastern red bats or our hoary bats or our silverhead bats, they're not in a bat box. They're not in a cave. They're just on a branch. They're hanging out basically like a leaf. You get a storm like that comes through and it knocks them right off, right? So those, those kinds of things could be problems as they become more frequent. Um, there's also the whole cascading effect. Most, all, all the bats that we have in temperate regions rely on insect populations. As the climate's changing, as we have pesticides, as we have land use change, there's the whole insect apocalypse concern. There's fewer and fewer flying insects that make it harder and harder for these bats to find food. So there's, there's, there's no one set answer. There's just there's a whole whack of things. Okay. I think we have time for what, one more question in here and one more online. Okay, so we'll do the online one. Blind is a bat, that common phrase, do you have an idea of where it came from? So you can imagine, right? Bats are nocturnal, they're flying around in the dark. You might imagine that they don't even need to see. So, and especially you take a bat like this, right? Our ghost face bat, their eye is tucked way back and you can hardly even see it. There's other bats that you can barely see there. It's there, but they, they probably don't use it very often. It's actually in fact covered by fur in some bats. So you can imagine how that fairly easily gets to be a, a perception that people have. Um, but there are, you know, bats can see quite well and, and certainly the flying foxes, flying foxes don't echolocate. So that black flying fox that I was releasing there, they don't echolocate, they fly by vision. They're like, they're like an owl in that sense. So they actually rely on their vision just being really, really low. Um, the other one that people you know, bring up a lot is the idea of bats getting stuck in your hair, which is why I have this haircut. <laughs> of course, that's an old, uh, an old tale that it doesn't actually happen. Bats don't get caught in your hair, it's perfectly safe. Great. Is there another question in here in the room? Okay, the, right here. So the question is, um, with climate change, are there species that are going to be expanding their distribution, bat species expanding into places like here in Ontario? Yeah, I, I think certainly we will see that. Um, we don't have any documentation of that yet, but I think it's almost certainly going to happen. For many, pardon me, for many of these species, they're limited in their normal, their northern range distribution by the environment. So little brown bats, there's a really neat study that does a bunch of climate models and says that if you find the isoline of certain temperature, that's about as far north as they could go. And sure enough, you can go and you find the northernmost known records of hibernating bats and they follow that line almost perfectly. So as that line shifts, you would imagine the bats could expand the range out. As you saw that, that image of the, the, the bats migrating in and back out, they can cover a whole lot of ground. You know, four or 500 kilometers is not out of the question for some of these bats. So there's, there's easily potential for these bats to make these big leaps. Um, I would even go so far as to hazard a guess as to what the species would be the first one that would come in. Um, I would imagine that Indiana bats are going to be the next species that might show up in Ontario. They're in Pennsylvania, they're in New York, they're in Michigan. Never been documented in Ontario, but I think it's only a matter of time. That's great. Thank you very much, Liam. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you.
you heard it here, folks, um, Indiana bats are the next one coming to Ontario. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank you all so much for coming and joining us for this fantastic lecture. Thank you so much. Um, make sure that you are on our subscription list for some of the next uh, new faculty lectures that we have coming down the pipeline. If you are not, come and chat with me afterwards and we'll make sure you're all set up. Um, I would like to thank Liam and Kirsten for coming out and speaking with us all today.